So it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today. The, the joint Aimsrik FMT speaker is going to be Jue Gong Wu from University of Buffalo. I've known Jue Gong for quite a while, uh, since the time that I was doing my PhD. Uh, we've been working in a similar area. Uh, Jue Gong works on the quantum coherence of electrons uh, and spins used for quantum computing. Uh, he does a lot of interesting material science uh, in silicon heterostructures, uh, including quantum dots and quantum wells. Uh, he also uh, has has a lot of basic knowledge in, in quantum computing and how to implement uh, quantum computers. And he's going to tell us about the strategies that we have for implementing quantum computing with spin qubits. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Bill. I was so happy. Hopefully, I, my talk is good enough for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, Bill works in a much broader area of physics than I do. So my work over the past uh, decade, I would say, uh, has been more focused on sort of strategies to implement spin qubits, uh, particularly in silicon. Uh, so, you know, I think Bill and I, we all started from very early days of spin qubits, but most people probably don't even know, especially younger ones, uh, what was uh, available at the beginning. So I think I will start with a sort of a little history of how we get to where we are now, and then discuss some of our recent work in this area. Okay, so let me acknowledge my uh, collaborators, my uh, students, and uh, former postdoc, Li uh, Hao uh, and supported by US Army Research Office. Okay, so, you know, Spin Qubit was, let's see, can I get too quick? Yeah. Okay, so Spin Qubits was propo uh, proposed quite a while ago. Uh, if, if you recall, you know, Peter Schor introduced his uh, Schor's algorithm of factorization back in 1993, I think, and then the quantum error correction that algorithm in 94. So after that, people start to think seriously, right? Uh, what a quantum computer can do. I still remember reading a physics study article by Harosh and Rimon, I think in 95. They were saying, ah, this is whole thing is just, you know, imagination of academic interest, even with quantum error correction, but probably not practical. Uh, but still, it gets a lot of physicists in excited about this field. And, you know, this is one of the earlier proposal of, you know, implementing a physical system for on computing, uh, if you look at you know when this work by Daniel uh, Laws and David Vincenzo, when they post down the archive, this was 1997 at the beginning. I think it was a KITP program, something like that. They were together and came up with the idea. It finally finally got published in 98, like one year later. I suppose they must have fought in PRL or wherever for a long time. Uh, but so this, this proposal came out a long time ago, 25 years ago now. Um, and one of the, you know, it's sort of natural to think, okay, you have electron, an electron spin is a spin half, so natural two-level system within a magnetic field. And so that's a natural qubit. And for particularly for electron spin in a solid state material, uh, we know you can do ESR, electron spin resonance to flip spin and put spin into any particular superposition state. And that was already demonstrated in the 1950s. And the, the biggest contribution of this work was to say that, well, you know, with trapped iron qubit, for example, it's difficult to couple qubits. But in a system, in a semiconductor system like this, in these, you know, you, oops. Uh, so going back to our discussion, uh, I think one of the biggest contribution of this work was to point out that if you are in a semiconductor have a structure where you can control, uh, if you can track electrons first, first of all, then you can possibly control tunnel coupling between neighboring quantum dots. And that gives you an electrical means to control the coupling of two different spin qubit. Okay. And the exchange coupling that you would have by allowing tunneling between those neighboring quantum dots, then you know it's a Coulomb interaction, right? Coulomb plus Pauli give you the exchange, and so that's a very strong interaction, give you a very fast two qubit gate in this system. So that I think was the 
sort of the key contribution of that proposal, uh, which got a lot of experimentalists interested and excited about as well. Okay. And so, you know, I think at that time, uh, people basically had two rough strategies. One is to use quantum dots. Uh, these quantum dots are so-called gated dots, where you grow a semiconductor hammer structure, where you trap a 2D electron gas, and then you grow metallic gates on top of the insulator to try to isolate those puddles of electron, deplete them until you get one electron per dot that give you the qubit. Or uh, as uh, Bruce Kane at the time, he was in, uh, in the University of New South Wales, I believe, and he proposed that use, we can use uh, phosphorus donors in silicon uh, for a spin qubit. Our original proposal was using nuclear spin of that phosphorus, but people later come up and say, you don't need the nuclear spin, we can use the electron spin as well. Okay. And his motivation was, well, you know, oh, we're going to semiconductor, we might as well go to silicon, which is behind the whole microelectronic industry. So uh, in a fight, you might as well have the 800 pound gorilla behind you right? instead of in front of you. Okay. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really matter which semiconductor you choose, Gallimard's night or silicon. Uh, this was the reality back in 1998, where really people haven't found a way to isolate a single electron in a quantum dot in semiconductors. Um, People don't know how to actually measure a single electron spin, right? You know, normally you think about marrying a small, it's a Bohr magneton, so measuring a very small magnetic signal at that time, the best magnetometer is a squid. So you put a squid on top of that quantum dot, you try to pick up a magnetic signal, whether the spin is up or down, right? Uh, you can imagine how slow the process has to be for you to acquire enough signal noise ratio to actually measure that. Uh, it's just not practical. Okay, so there's no single spin measurement technique back then. Uh, all the ways people characterize electron uh, in quantum dots was actually through transport. You put a quantum dot, you put two leads on um, you know, source and drain, and you look at the current passing through the quantum dot and look at the characteristic of transport to sort of infer what's going on in that quantum dot. And that type of experimental techniques that even after that, the proposal of qubit, I think roughly to 2005 or so, it was still the predominant experimental way to you know, figure out what the spin is doing in the quantum. Okay. And back then, all the leading experimental groups actually working in Gallimard's night quantum dot, you know, it came from the quantum Hall effect, right? Where people were able to make very high quality Gallimard's night heterostructures uh, to very high mobility to the electron gas in Gallimard's night. And so naturally, people would think, okay, let's go to those material structure, uh, material systems where you have the high, highest quality uh, to the structure. And there you go, gates to get your quantum dot. Okay, so this was what happened then. The experimentalists, you know, you can never underestimate their ingenuity. So quickly after 98, people came up with different ways to solve those issues, those problems that uh, we faced. Well, the first step was actually occurred in Canada, in CNRC in Ottawa. Uh, this is uh, Andy Sakrashna School, who first came up with a way, with a geometric design of the pathways, so that in a transport experiment, they can actually deplete a quantum dot down to one electron. Okay, so it was just more or less a design of the top gates, how you, you know, structure your plunger gate relative to the gates that control the barriers that allow the tunneling from and to the reservoir, quantum dots. And they were able to actually, you know, uh, go down to one electron per quantum dot. And, you know, eventually, like by now, people don't use this technique anymore. But this was very important at that time uh, to allow people to finally have a single electron. Okay. And another important uh, uh, breakthrough was really in how to actually try to measure a single electron spin. Now, this work 
uh, which was published in 2002 coming out of NTT group, uh, Tarusha's group. Uh, at the time, it wasn't projected as a spin measurement technique. It was just showing that you can have this so-called uh, uh, poly spin block K uh, phenomena in the transport through a double quantum dot. Okay, and as you can see from the title of the, of the paper, it more or less focus on the transport current. It's about current rectification. So it's like a diode, where in one direction of transport, you have a lot range of uh, bias potential where the current is essentially zero, while in the other direction, you can have a current uh, with a potential, uh, with a uh, voltage run. Okay. And the basic principle behind there is basically that if you have two electrons, let's imagine two electrons in a double quantum dot. If you have two electrons, one in each dot, then the singlet state and triplet state, spin states, they correspond to roughly the same charge distribution with one charge in each dot. Okay, so you have, whether it's a sing singlet or it's a triplet, the charge distribution is roughly the same. So the splitting, energy splitting generally is pretty small. Okay. On the other hand, if you put both of those electrons in one of the quantum dot, well, if it is a singlet, both electrons can go into the ground state, orbital state, while if it is a triplet, one of the electrons has to go to the excited orbital state, right? Because of Pauli principle. Okay. And so that gave you a large singlet triplet splitting. Okay. So this Pauli blockade basically take advantage of that discrepancy between the spectrum of singlet versus triplet, so that if the electron is in a singlet, you can tunnel through. If it is a triplet, it doesn't because the transport is blocked. And that gives you this sort of, uh, this current rectification phenomenon, okay? But the key observation there really is at the end of the day, the correlation between the spin state and the charge distribution, right? Because singlet and triplet, one of them can go into the zero two configuration where two electrons are in one dot. Well, for triplet in some particular bias regime, it can only stay in one one. Okay, so now you can imagine if you have a charge sensor nearby the double quantum dot that can sense the electric, electrical distribution, the charge distribution, then by measuring the charge distribution, you can infer back to what was the spin configuration. Okay, and you know, back in the even in the late 1990s, there were already very good charge sensors available that can detect a fraction of charge. Okay, and so now that this particular experimental discovery allows us to actually establish correlations between the charge distribution and spin states, and then by measuring the charge, you can infer back to what is the spin state. Okay, so that becomes a important way to measure single electron spin. So instead of directly measuring the magnetic signal using a squid, now you can do a charge measurement, which can be much more easily done. Okay, so that was, I think, really an important experimental development that allows the single, a single electron spin measurement. Okay, and no matter whether in gallium arsenide or silicon, it turns out the spin orbit interaction is not that strong. Okay, so you know there's always a question of how do you flip single electron spin. As I mentioned in the original proposal, the proposal was just you know using the traditional ESR, using a AC magnetic field, well a DC magnetic field to split the spin level, the qubit, and then introduce a transverse AC field, magnetic field to flip the spin, right? That's typical electron spin resonance sort of protocol. Uh, it turns out that you know, with magnetic signal, it's a pretty difficult task to get fast enough location because you basically need to pass a big current through AC currents through the sample, next to the sample, which would cause all sorts of issues if you pass a big enough current, right? Keeping photoassisted paneling, things like that. Okay. Uh, so people came up with the idea of driving this spin rotation instead of using magnetic field, using the electric field. Okay, the electric field also is very local, right? So you can choose any particular quantum dot 
drive the local gates to rotate the spin. But if you want to use an electrical field to drive a magnetic moment, you need something to connect them. So naturally, you would say, oh, use, use spin orbit interaction. Okay, turns out, as I mentioned, silicon and gallium arsenide, they're both light elements. The spin orbit interaction is not very strong. Okay, uh, but in 2006, I believe, and then finally demonstrated in 2008, people also came up with the idea of introducing an artificial spin orbit interaction by introducing a magnetic field gradient in the sample. When you do that, if you have an electric field shape the electron in that field gradient, you can imagine from the electron rest frame, you know, now you actually have an AC magnetic field, right? And that AC magnetic field you can drive the spin orbit. You have a transverse to it. Okay. And so that becomes, especially in silicon, that becomes sort of the most dominant single spin uh, rotation technique. Uh, by now. Okay. All right. And lastly, this is where you know we marry the spin blockade idea together with charge sizing was to go away from the transport measurements. You know, as I said, up to 2005 or so, all the measurements of electron spin states in quantum dust were using transport. You can imagine if you have a qubit sitting in a quantum dot, you want to keep that qubit, right? Instead of keep flushing it out down to the drain, uh, you know, every time you measure. So uh, people already were thinking about that and came up with this, this idea of using a charge sensor. So basically you have this, let's say you have some spin qubit over here in this quantum dot, and then you put a charge sensor next to it. A charge sensor could be a single electron transistor, Right, where the gate potential on the island would determine the transport property of that single electron transistor or a common point contact without that, you know, doubt, just a channel. Again, the currents through a QPC point contact uh, would be affected by the potential it experiences. Okay, and that potential comes from that potential comes from the charge distribution here, whether you have Three electron over here, or one electron in each dot. The difference of electrical dis uh, charge distribution would produce a different electrical potential at the charge sensor, which allow you to refer back to the charge distribution. Okay, and so this particular experiment from 2005, coming out of Charles uh, Clapper's group, basically was one of the first to demonstrate. It was a charge sensor on the qubit to proper measurements. Okay, on the screen. All right. And so by that time, I roughly sort of the middle of 2000, and certainly by now, uh, I would say all the basic ingredients for a spin are already demonstrated. Okay. So single electron quantum dots was already, you know, demonstrated. And this was first done, as I mentioned, using the particular gate structure that the CNRC people designed. But later, as people introduce the charge sensors, they don't need the tunnel current from the source drain to the quantum dot to be always finite anymore. You can make that tunnel very small. And that, you know, with the charge sensor, you can still measure whether you are at the last electron or not. So by now, you don't even need to go with the particular gate structure. With the charge sensor, you can you know, make sure you can not have only one electron pretty easily. So it's pretty routinely done now uh, using, you know, doing single electron quantum dots. Indeed, people start to think, maybe we want to get a few more electrons in there, you know, with the charge distribution, maybe we can screen out some noise better, et cetera. So, you know, now people can have very good control of how many electrons they have in the single spin manipulation, we already, people already demonstrated of both normal regular ESR and the EDSR, the electrically driven uh, or electric dipole spin resonance. Okay, uh, so either way, using intrinsic or extrinsic spin mobility coupling, you can rotate spins, put them into nice uh, coherent superpositions. Single spin measurement has been done either with spin-dependent tunneling, turns out you can 
apply a big magnetic field, split the uh, spin up and down states, and stick a reservoir with Fermi level in between those. And then you can do spin dependent tunneling. So that allows you to do single spin measurement as well, together with a charge sensor, or using the poly spin coupling to measure spins. Okay. And two spin coupling, as I mentioned, it's actually pretty strong. So people actually don't want to go to large coupling limit because the electronics that are available now are just not fast enough to actually deal with really strong coupling. But it's definitely already demonstrated. Okay. And so even further beyond the single spin encoding of a qubit, as in the original last even sense of proposal, people also came up with different ways. For example, encoding a qubit into two spin state, single triplet state, or into three spin uh, state, you know, the so-called decoherence free subspace, where the control of the qubit state can be done completely electrically using an exchange coupling without magnetic pulses. Okay, so you have, I would say, quite a lot of progresses uh, in how to control the uh, uh, swing qubit and measure them. Okay. Now, one thing I haven't talked about is the material system. As I mentioned, the original works in swing qubit are mostly done in gallium arsenide. Um, and I think they culminated in these works coming out of uh, Harvard, um, both Charlie and uh, and uh, uh, Amelia Kobe's group in looking into uh, two spin states in a gallium arsenide double quantum dot. Uh, this was sort of the first demonstration of uh, 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 both free induction decay and, uh, uh, and the charge echoes, uh, not charge echoes, spin echoes for those states uh, where the uh, coherence time, if you look at it, T2 star time is pretty short. Uh, in the order of like 10 nanosecond or something. And then even after you do introduce the echo uh, to eliminate sort of the quasi-static noise spectrum, uh, the aha echo time is still only up to maybe 10 microseconds. I think in the original Python experiment, it was only one microsecond because of poor calibration and things like that. But later, in Amelia Kobe groups, if um, you want up to 10 microseconds. Okay. Uh, mostly the reason for that is because of the underlying nuclear spins. In gallium arsenide, you, know, you have three isotopes gallium 69, 71, and arsenic 75. All three isotopes are spin three halves. So you have nuclear spins everywhere. The electron goes into that system, the electron conduction electron, you have an antibonding S state has finite probability at the nuclear size, so they have a finite contact, hyperfine contact, okay, which the electron spin can see basically all the nuclear spins through that interaction. Okay, so even at the dilution fridge temperature, 100 millikelvin, and the electron temperature, well, 20, 30 millikelvin base temperature, for the nuclear spins in the, relatively small magnetic field, let's say one Tesla or half a Tesla, nuclear spins are still thermal. Okay, the nuclear magneton is so small that nuclear spin distribution is basically thermal distribution. Okay, so it points every which way. So from the electron spin perspective, you see this randomly distributed nuclear spins give you an effective sort of random uh, magnetic environment. Okay, now, if there's no dynamics, which is sort of true, the nuclear spins do evolve slowly in the time scale that the electron spins uh, actually have dynamics. They are relatively slow, but still, there are dynamics in there, right? There is the double coupling between nuclear spins, there is the electron mediated uh, electron spin, uh, nuclear spin couplings, etc. So, with dynamics in that reservoir, in that magnetic environment, that gives you the coherence of the electron spin. That limits sort of the coherence property of the, uh, of the electron spin. Now, the coupled electron nuclear spin system is quite an interesting system, central spin problem, that has a lot of interest from different areas of physics. And so within this 
sort of decoherence perspective, many groups have worked on it, such as our host Bill here uh, with his PhD advisor, uh, but many other people have worked on it as well. So it's still an interesting problem. But from a qubit perspective, it's a headache that you would rather have not have, right? And so that sort of lead people to say, oh, maybe we should listen to Bruce K and just go back to sleep. You know, that way you'll get rid of the issues related to the nuclear spins because in silicon, you have naturally, you have only 5% of the isotopes that have spin. Huh? And you can do isotopic enrichment to even reduce that number. Okay. Uh, I think one of the other reasons was people also recognizing that you don't really need that high mobility for making good quality quantum dots. Right? You know, for, for quantum Hall effect, what you do is you really dope those gallium arsenide structures heavily to give you a large enough number of electrons in the 2D electron gas. And the presence of that large 2D electron gas would actually screen out all the disorders from the dopants. Right? By modulation doping, you, you screen them out. Okay. Um, so it's like, you know, at the high tide, all the rocks on the seashore, you don't see them. They're all underwater. Okay. But we're working with quantum dots. We want to have one electron for quantum dot or a few electrons for quantum dot. So we're going to deplete the whole system down. Right? So you're going to the low tide where the waters are gone. There are only little puddles left. You're not screening anything anymore. And so, you know, the electrical disorder actually is all revealed right, from the dopants and everything. And so, you know, the high mobility in the quantum hull samples of guiding mars that really has no sort of implication for a quantum dot with the qubits. And so with silicon, which traditionally always have relatively low mobility in those, you know, high density regimes, at the low density regime, if you try to remove all those charge disorder and charge defect, then silicon is no worse than. Okay, so that also allows people to sort of move more comfortably into silicon from polymer side. Now in silicon, there are multiple ways people have now generated quantum dots from the sort of the traditional 2D, uh, 2D quantum dots with top gates and everything to donors. And donors, you can implant them, just shoot donors phosphorus into silicon and then anneal it, sort of try to anneal away all the damage the implantation does to your uh, silicon lattice and then do experiment there, or you simply do MB rolls, which is extremely difficult, but it's still being pursued. Okay. And more recently, people also came up with ways of using silicon nanowires and then grow so-called overlapping gates because silicon does have larger effective mass compared to gallium arsenide. So when you try to grow quantum dot with large enough uh, orbital excitation energy, you have to make the quantum dot smaller than in gallium arsenide. Okay, and uh, using the 2D sort of structure is a little harder to do that. Uh, with the overlapping gates, you can make the dots larger, uh, you know, but smaller uh, because you're putting gates on top of each other. The metal gates on top of each other. Okay, but with all these different schemes, people have made a lot of progress in silicon quantum dots. Uh, for example, this was with uh, isotopic and enriched uh, samples in silicon. This was silicon moss type of sample from back in 2014 and 15, type of time period almost 10 years ago, um, where you can see the sort of the contrast and the fidelity of. Uh, spin rotations in those uh, in those samples, okay, in both kind of dots and uh, donors uh, spin, and also coupled to spin dynamics, also with pretty high fidelity there, okay. And those was those were from 2014-15 uh, in silicon moss, and in just this past year there have been several experiments. Uh, in mostly silicon, silicon germanium type of sample. So active layer is still silicon, but the barrier instead of oxide now is replaced with a silicon germanium 
uh, people have demonstrated uh, gate fidelities, single spin and qubit gate fidelity in the order of 99.9%, .9 and two spin, uh, two qubit gate fidelity 99.5% sort of ratio. Uh, so, you know, you look at the title of those papers, they are saying, well, we're at the sort of threshold where we can implement uh, surface code to do quantum error already. Okay. Um, you know, if you just look at those gate fidelities, sure, you can. You're, you're at the threshold, but as I will mention later, other requirements too. But, you know, nevertheless, you can see the huge progress between now, you know, where we have these high fidelity gates uh, compared to, for example, the earlier work I showed uh, coming out of Hubble uh, from Gavi Marsnack to spin oscillation, right? Where T2 star is 10 nanosecond, T2 echo is like 10 microsecond. Here, it's really high fidelity gates, right? Okay. So this is where we are now in terms of uh, spin qubits, mostly now studied in silicon. Um, you know, again, we have very long coherence time. Even in, you know, Gali Mars night, people already after 2005, people pushed along that direction a bit further and show that even there you can sort of implement strategies to enhance the coherence time uh, to overcome the effect of the nuclear spins. But in silicon, especially with isotopic purification or enrichment, you can have really good coherence time. Okay. Uh, exchange coupling is very strong, and the spin rotations can be done both magnetic and electrically. Okay. But we still have issues to deal with. Okay. Even with those high fidelity gates, as you can see from those papers, they're all implemented in double quantum, just two quantum. Okay, uh, you know, so there's no clear indication yet. And when you go to larger samples, I think uh, several experimental groups are pushing to like six qubits and things like that. Um, but still, no uh, concrete evidence to show those same sort of high fidelity gates yet. Okay, uh, so in silicon, there are still multiple issues that we face. Uh, starting from the conduction band structure that is somewhat more complicated than Gallimard's night, which I will discuss later, uh, the so-called value physics. And also, I would say from a long-term perspective, the difficulty in implementing all the micromagnets that allow us to have that magnetic field gradient and the artificial spin interaction. You, know, you have two qubits, fine, you put a micromagnet on top, you get enough gradient to do anything. But if you ha have 100 qubits, obviously one micromagnet wouldn't do it. You have to introduce multiple, how to put them. And you know, you have a nice semiconductor structure, you put a whole bunch of magnet on top. It's never a sort of a realistic strategy in, in that sense, right? Um, also, exchange coupling is short range. It needs tunnel coupling to be allowed. So uh, how to if you have a large structure, how to do long distance communication on chip is another question. Um, I think one of the key issues with regard to how to implement quantum error correction would be measurement. Now, the measurement we have, there are really nice ways to do measurement, single spin measurement, but we also have to recognize those are converting spin to charge. And even with that conversion, the measurement is pretty slow. Okay, at the, at the current time, the fastest measurement is maybe a couple of microseconds to do a measurement. Okay, and the current uh, available silicon samples, the normal T2 star time is a few microseconds. It's not even 10 microseconds. Okay, and so, you know, you do measurements on some qubit, not everything, then uh, yeah, the everything else would basically because of T2 star, we lose the phase information. Okay, so how to actually make faster measurement and things like that? It's still very open question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the current status. Uh, from here on, I'm going to go focus more on my own group's research. Any question from the audience? 
At this point, yeah, I'm kind of curious just about well, why is the germanium so much better than silicon oxide? Uh, you mean the silicon germanium barrier? Yeah. Uh, so, what people did was, well, first of all, I don't know it's much better in the following sense. The silicon mass experiment I showed was done by uh, back in 2015 or so. Uh, the latest experiment also have higher fidelity, maybe not as high as the silicon germanium, but nearly. Okay. Now, one issue with silicon oxide barrier is the oxide is alloy, it's not crystal. Okay. Uh, and there are always defects um, at the interface or inside the oxides. Okay. And while silicon germanium, they were grown lattice map. So the interface quality is certainly higher than silicon oxide samples. Okay. I, th I think, or I suspect, that would be part of the reason why in silicon germanium you have more consistency in producing quantum dots and also in higher quality measurements. Are there any sort of like promising proposals for long distance communication? I guess you can't just like pattern a bunch of these next to each other and hope they interact. Yeah, there are multiple proposals, different ways you can do it. Uh, for example, coupling spin to a photon and do on-chip com uh, communications through the photon. Uh, that has been done experimentally, shown experimentally that you can reach strong coupling limit between spin and the photon, just barely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and again, it also depends on the micromagnet. So there are still questions whether it's a long-term strategy. Uh, other ways, including using the spin chain, for example, or just really do bucket brigade, just transport mm -hmm. the spins across samples. Uh, instead of using, you know, swap gates to swap the spin state, you can just take an electron and transport it, yeah. right? And so there are different proposals. Which one would come out on top? I don't know. They all have their proposals. If there are any questions from people watching online, please just raise your hand. I'll try to interrupt straight on the question that you're asking. Right. Okay, so let me move on to what uh, we have been doing over the past uh, quite a few years, I would say. Um, so, as I mentioned, there are all these different ways, different issues that we have, uh, we have faced in silicon. Uh, in my own group, we have looked at multiple issues with regard to uh, spin qubits in silicon, start from spin decoherence, and spin communication, um, or going into hybrids. But you know, here I'm going to focus on one of the issues that uh, we have been studying over the past few years is on the so-called value orbit coupling in silicon. Okay. And so for that, we need to go back to sort of the basic uh, material physics of silicon. Um, you know, gallium arsenide has a particularly simple structure in terms of its band structure, okay? Uh, the bottom of the conduction band in gallium arsenide is at gamma point, the center of the first bearing zone, uh, and the top of its valence band is also there at the center of the uh, first bearing zone. So it's a so-called direct semiconductor, that's why, you know, optically, you can, uh, electronically, uh, gallium arsenide is sort of dominant material for that, for those applications, okay? And for incubate qubit application, it also gives us a very simple structure where you can just describe the yeah, electron spin of gallium arsenide using effective mass model easily. So still a single electron with a quadratic dispersion, it's just a different effective mass. And that effective mass is more or less isotropic uh, in the 3D material. Okay. Silicon is a little bit different. Silicon actually is, valence band is still, top of valence band is still at the gamma point, but it's minimum of the conduction band is far away near the X point, about 85% out towards the X point along the, you know, 100, 001, 010 in those directions. Okay, so you, you have actually six equivalent conduction, conduction lines. Okay, so they are way out there uh, towards the X points. So in the 
basically, you know, silicon can give you a very quiet magnetic environment for the skin qubit, but electrically, it could give you a little bit extra freedom, right? Because now you have degeneracy in the conduction band, so that potentially give you more freedom in terms of the orbital dynamics of the electron, okay? And so, you know, here we have the buck, we have, you know, this is first square zone, you have six equivalent uh, degenerate conduction band minima. Now, our qubits are always residing in the heterostructure, right? So the typical two-dimensional heterostructure, you have silicon, and then you have barrier material, whether it's silicon oxide or silicon germanium. Um, so you have this barrier in there and with a potential, and that generally lift for out the conduction bands minima half relative to the other two. Okay, so let's say the growth direction is zero, zero, 001, then because of the mass and isotropy, so basically, you know, the dispersion near this conduction band minima are different along one direction relative to the other two direction. Okay, the effective mass are different, right? One is 0 0.9, the other one is 0 0.2, roughly. And because of that mass and isotropy, four of the bands will actually go half relative to two of them. Okay. And then, because of the presence of the interface, the electron would scatter of that interface. That would actually also couple these two induction at minimum. Okay. And that gave you the so-called value splitting. So this is this coupling between these, let's say, Z and Z bar values. That coupling is the so-called value orbit coupling. Okay, and that leads to a splitting of that degeneracy. But otherwise, at this point, they are still degenerate, but because of the scattering of the interface, they are actually not degenerate anymore. You have so-called plus minus value. If you think the value orbit coupling to be real, then you have you know the z plus z bar as the ground value, z minus z bar as the intended value, with a splitting that depends on the strength of that scattering, right? Well, unfortunately, that coupling actually is not real. It's general complex. So the superposition actually depends on the phase of that value orbit coupling. Okay. And so, you know, one thing that we have been doing was to try to explore, first of all, how the, this, uh, the phase of the complex Coupling, value orbit coupling come about, how it might change depending on the circuit interface, and then what are the consequences that we have this uh, uh, value orbit phase. Okay. And, you know, so one of the uh, calculation my student has done was basically looking at the interface and say, well, how do we model the interface roughness? Now, if it is silicon oxide, the, 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 the surface roughness, the interface roughness is more or less sort of the diffusion of oxygen into the silicon and silicon into the silicon oxide layer, right? So you just, instead of silicon O2, you have a slab X in there, you know, extra silicon, and then in the silicon layer, you have some oxygen. So you have no just run sort of rough interface instead of a really monolayer interface. In silicon germanium, because you grow the sample MBE and grow with very high uh, quality, you can have a relatively flat interface, but generally you have these so called steps where you have silicon and silicon germanium, but then at some point you actually shift that interface by one atomic model layer. Okay, the strategy was implemented mostly to release whatever strain in the sample. So people tend to actually do that. And at the end of the result, what happened is if you look at the interface, you see these different sort of steps in the, at the interface, okay? So my students start to sort of go in and say, okay, let's introduce one step, maybe two steps, and see how the value orbit company could be uh, influenced by that, okay? Question there, right? Question on say if you've got on top of a flat terrace there, which also always going to be defects on the silicon surface. How do those defects? Yes. Yes. Is that, is that, 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 that So 
generally when they grow it, the, the, the atoms would tend to go into the steps so that the steps would grow, okay? But still, when you grow the next layer, there will be segregation, there will be diffusion. So really, each of the terraces are generally not completely green. Okay. So I mean, uh, let's think like planning bonds of the terrace. Uh, uh, defects on the cleaning. Good point. Yes. Zero, 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 yes. Zero, so. yes. It could be. It could be something. Like so right now you're just looking at the steps, so right? Right now we're only looking at the steps because you know supposedly so, silicon germanium and silicon have the same um, yeah. data structures. So even with the step, theoretically you don't have to have dangling ones, but in reality that's totally different. Good question there. Yeah. yeah, so for us, we just look at, you know, assuming we have a good sharp stack without numbering bonds, what happens? Okay, so for that, you can actually treat it within the effective mass model. Uh, so what we did was coming up using a variational approach to simulate the wave function, how it should change around the stack. And then what we could calculate is we can look at the magnitude of the value orbit coupling and the phase of the value orbit coupling, see how it depends on where that step is within the quantum dot. Okay, you know, let's say you have a quantum dot step would cut right through the middle of the dot, we're only going through the edge. So the quantum dot mostly sit on the terrace or actually sit on the step, right? So we can see how as we move the step within the quantum dot, how the value orbit coupling changes. And what we found was that the value orbit coupling magnitude can change pretty dramatically you know, from, let's say, one down to maybe 0 0.3, so a 70% reduction there when the step sits in the middle of the dot. Uh, and the phase, the value orbit phase could actually switch by uh, quite a lot, right? right? From three all the way to Roughly, it's roughly zero, so from close to pi, roughly to zero. Okay, so you can have actually a phase shift, a pi, almost pi phase shift uh, in the value uh, orbit coupling. Okay. And so, you know, then the question is well, how would this impact what we study as the qubits? For one time, the study of value orbit physics is mostly focused on single quantum dot. And from that perspective, the most important quantity is the magnitude of the value. Okay, because the phase doesn't really come into play in terms of the electron dynamics in that system. All you want to see is how much splitting you actually introduce. And for a long time, people struggle to get consistently large value. Okay, uh, so I remember uh, several years ago. Uh, Jason Panos group, one of the leading experimental groups studying this uh, steam qubits in silicon, they made a 12 quantum dot sample in silicon germanium. Uh, but you know, their particular interface was relatively slow varying in terms of the gradient from silicon to silicon germanium. So instead of a sharp interface, you have an interface that is several Einstrom thing. Okay. And what happened was out of those. So the 12 quantum dots, three of them acts as sensor dots. So there are nine active qubit dots. Turns out more than half of them, they couldn't detect any value of splitting, any value splitting. They couldn't see it. So the splitting is so small, it's just not in the resolution of their experimental technique to differentiate the two values. Okay. So the PPU value orbit coupling is small, the magnitude is very small, then you know. It could introduce issues with respect to its spin, right? Not exactly clear at this point, but I will mention later how it could influence the spin. Okay. Uh, but you know, that was sort of the most people most interested in is to find out how to make the value of it coupling larger in terms of its magnitude. If you only focus on the single down physics. But when you go beyond the single dot, if you go to a double quantum dot, the phase also comes into play, right? Because as I mentioned before, the value orbit coupling 
is really sensitive to how the interface looks. What is the detail of atomic detail of that interface? So that face, if you can have a face to describe it, uh, would be something that actually depends on the details of that interface. And so two quantum dots generally do not share exactly the same interface, and that means their faces, the value of the face, could very well right? Uh, so, you know, if you just focus on the charge dynamics in the double quantum dot and include the value physics, then in general, this you have four levels, right? One electron in left, one in right, and then the two value states. So you have four states. Okay. If you have the same value orbit property in terms of its face, even if you have different magnitude, then you would have these anti-crossings, instead of anti-crossing, they would be crossing because the value eigenstates are also two value eigenstates are also right? Doesn't matter what are the eigenstates, at least the two eigenstates are also So you will have crossings and then you have just two anti-crossings there. Okay. But because of the fact that the phase generally are different, so the value eigenstates in two quantum dots are generally not identical, making them non-orthogonal, different states non-orthogonal, so that now you generally have all the anti-crossings, which means all the tunnel companies are allowed from each state, each value and non states to the other. They're all allowed. Okay. And so that has implications starting from just characterizing the tunnel company, which uh, my former postdoc worked out. You know, when you're just trying to characterize what are the tunnel coupling between the ground states between two quantum dots, if you don't include the fact that there could be this value physics that interfere with your um, measurements, you can be way off in estimating what is the tunnel coupling between your ground states. Okay. Uh, but certainly, when you go into the spin physics, if you don't know the tunnel coupling, obviously that will have impact on the spin coupling as well, right? And so, you know, that's one of the problems my student, former student, uh, Bilal worked out, is to calculate the exchange coupling in the silicon uh, double quantum dot. And this is what he found, you know, uh, when you calculate the ground and uh, the singlet and ground triplet states uh, as a function of the value phase difference between across the double quantum dot. Um, which is sort of interesting, right? If the phase are completely the same, then you have a finite uh, exchange splitting, but if the phase is opposite from each other, roughly, then that exchange splitting could go down to a very small value. Wow, this limit is zero. Okay, so what is the physics here? Physics is actually pretty straightforward, but also pretty interesting. So if you are working at the limit, where you have the same phases across the double quantum dot, the exchange splitting comes out like this. So if you have a single state, so now the red and the blue represent the value eigenstates. Okay. And so in this case, across the two dots, you have the same value eigenstates as the ground state, same value eigenstate as the excited state. The ground singlet would actually go in here, right? With the electron, each electron occupying the ground state. Okay. And so that singlet would be actually energetically to couple to this double occupied singlet in each of the quantum dots, right? So they are all coupled. This electron can tunnel into that. Okay. And because of that coupling, the singlet is low, the ground singlet would be lower relative to just that configuration. Okay. There's also a Coulomb contribution, obviously, and that would have to be included as well. Well, you know, for this simple picture, I'm just going to focus on the super exchange part. On the other hand, for the triplet, now this spin obviously cannot tunnel into that one anymore, right? Because of the Pauli principle. So at this spin, this electron also cannot tunnel into that empty blue state because the value eigenstates are orthogonal, so the electron spin can't go into that state. Okay, so relative to this state, the singlet gets stressed by the double occupied state, its energy is low. That gives you the finite exchange speed. 
turns out the Coulomb contribution to the exchange follow the same sort of pattern. So at the end, when you add the two together, you get what you have here. On the other hand, if you actually have a phase shift, high phase shift between the ground orbital state and the two sides, this is what you have. Okay, so this ground orbital state and this ground orbital state in the left and right dot are orthogonal to each other. And the ground singlet will still be occupying these ground states. And now this spin, that uh, this singlet state would be dressed by this sort of a double occupied signal, right? Because this spin cannot tunnel into this from a blue, cannot tunnel into the red state. It can only tunnel to the blue state. Okay. So this singlet would be dressed by this double occupied state or that. Okay. But if you look at the triplet, it turns out that process is allowed as well. Right, because now you know this spin can tunnel into that blue state or the other way around. So both the singlet and triplet are dressed by the same type of double occupied state. They have the same degree of lowering in energy because of the coupling to the state. Turns out the again the exchange contribution from Coulomb interaction follow roughly the same pattern. So now, both singlet and triplet states are lowered relative to the static states, and that gives you the uh, give you a zero splitting between ground singlet and triplet states. Okay, so that gives you this sort uh, of the phase dependence in terms of the exchange complex. Okay, and you know, so that's sort of what we observed. So that basically sort of gave you an additional concern in fabricating these silicon quantum dots and make sure that you actually have uh, uh, always finite exchange coupling. Okay. We're running out of time, so I'm going to just jump over to the end. Um, we also looked into you know, how the magnitude of value orbit coupling can affect the exchange. Uh, so at the end, I, can, I, I would just say that it's clear that the electronic structure, you know, in the energy uh, band structure for silicon does play some role in determining the spin properties, spin qubit properties in these uh, silicon samples. And uh, we have to sort of deal with those problems as we face them. Okay. And in terms of the long term future, I would say, uh, as I mentioned before, we still need faster measurements and we have to find ways to. So now fight with the valley problem, and uh, uh, maybe also find ways to get rid of that macromagnets. Um, but we also know we do have very good coherence property, and people have now have very good control of these spin qubits. So you know, I think the the overall picture, the long term picture, is still not clear whether this will become a scheme that eventually overtake the uh, superconducting qubits or not. So I'll leave that as an open question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've already had a few questions during the talk, but if there are any more questions, maybe we can get five minutes. More questions. Michael, yeah? Yes, yeah, so should we give you this, uh, this step as a fundamental issue, or do you see a way to get, you know, get around it? Uh, so I would say, it's a challenge, but I think it's fundamental in the sense that you make these samples, uh, if a quantum dot happen to sit exactly on top of the step, you'll face some issues with it. Um, you always can find a way to go around it. And this is only one type of interface disorder. So to really clarify this issue, you probably need to do more calculation and measurements to see the statistics, right? Uh, if only 10% of the samples uh, quantum dots are suppressed, you can always get around it. You now in our current computers, not all the transistors work, right, in those chips. And it is, so as long as you're building enough redundancy, you should be able to overcome. Okay. So I wouldn't say it's fundamental, but it's, it is a technical.
And there's a question online from Jose Bustamante. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yes, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, perfectly. All right, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I was just wondering if you could comment on the role of defects or, um, or different dopant atoms in the quantum dots produced at uh, New University of, of New South Wales. I wonder how significant is the role of these defects in decoherence? Mm, uh, good question. I guess it's not just uh, samples produced in USW, but everywhere. Uh, so <laughs> one thing is, uh, so it depends on whether you are talking about a donor-based system or the quantum dot system. In quantum dot system these days, people do not use uh, depletion mode anymore. So basically, they do not dope their samples. They use accumulation points, so use top gates to actually occupy the quantum dot to draw electrons from leads. OK. And so that greatly alleviates issues of electrical disorder. Truth is, disorder itself is not too big of a deal if it is static. OK. Mostly from a decoherence perspective, it's a question of whether a defect has dynamics. If it has dynamic, then you always face that issue. So I think right now, a lot of the dynamics of defects come from the surface, where you have insulator with metal gates, and that's where often uh, defects would come in, uh, no matter which type of samples you have. OK. And People do believe that might be the main reason for the electrically induced noise. Uh, with isotopic purification, when you look back at those 2015 examples, uh, it was like 800 ppm, so 99.9% .9 pure silicon 28. Uh, still, that 0.1% silicon 29 actually can give you pretty significant T2 star reduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so people are now pushing to even higher degree of purification to get rid of the nuclear spin noise. Uh, so that part can still be improved. Okay. Yeah. But, Thank you, know, you so much. Uh, yeah, I think electrical defects will still be sort of for a while be the most important. Okay, um, we're actually a little bit over time. So I think uh, let's thank Shui Dong again. Thank you.